Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 10th and final for now episode of the Roto Grinders So Rare podcast. If you are just joining us, make sure you check the link in the description and get a free limited card with the purchase of five cards in the auction house. And joining me once again for the last time in this current batch of podcasts is Andrew Laird, Lairdino on So Rare. Laird, how are you doing today? I'm good. That a uh, final for now is very uh, both ominous and encouraging. Yeah, you know, I got to keep the options open. As far as I'm told, this is the last one we're doing currently, but that could change literally as early as tomorrow. This this all sort of came together last minute as well. So uh, I might still do some stuff on my own individually as well. Um, but right now, this time of year is so busy for me, as you know. I'm just nonstop doing stuff. So popping on the So Rare Andrews podcast like once a month is is more appetizing to me than doing two or three times a week on my own. So I, I got to sit down and and think if I want to do some stuff. But what I might do is I might take a little bit of a break from recording some podcasts, maybe hop on as a guest occasionally, and then maybe come like January, I will start doing a once or twice a week show when I have a bit more free time. That's kind of where I'm thinking on things. I'm looking forward to the January 2nd uh, DM from you like, hey, can you do four so rare shows a week? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It, it probably will happen. I, I, We can talk about it, as you and I just talked about before we came on, but we can talk about so rare for hours upon hours a day. If I don't have any other obligations, I generally just sit on so rare and so rare <laughs> data and check the auction prices, check the secondary market, see what's going on. Uh, just right now, it's, it's I'm keeping up with stuff, but... This weekend's probably gonna gonna be a disaster in regards to just DNPs all over the place. So, trying to do some research and being on top of that stuff, but man, we will wait and see on that. Yeah, that, <clears throat> there's only so much research you can do. It's funny that you've decided to choose the two like most far-reaching sports in terms of research when it comes to international soccer and college football. That uh, yeah, there's plenty of research to to do. But I was gonna say one of the things I think I mentioned this somewhere else that. One of the things I really like about so rare is that it's like an incredible time killer that if you're just like, instead of like flicking on, you know, some sort of social media platform, you're like, oh, let me just check the auctions. Let's see what sec the secondary market has. Like there's always something that you can be doing on so rare and it's enjoyable enough that like, I like doing that stuff. So it's uh, you can spend a ton of time doing this if you really wanted to. Yeah, exactly. Like if the issue for me is it's more of like a primary and everything else is sort of the time suck that kills off time from so rare. So right. <laughs> That's where it becomes difficult for me. I mean, I love, like last week I was on the computer, I would say 18 hours a day for the last two weeks straight. So not doing that is probably, like, if I can knock off any time right now to not sit on the computer, I, I have to do it. So, I mean, my wife likes to see me occasionally. Uh, mm. So got, got to make the exception for stuff like that. So anyways, today we are going to talk about some of our best and worst purchases uh, since being on the platform, because I think what people do is people struggle to one sell cards that uh, are hot or that they have a connection with. And I think that this would be a bit of an idea of like when to sell realistically. And then also I think people struggle to know when to buy a card. It's like if you're buying a card at the peak over and over again, that's not a good way to do things. And that's generally going to be a very poor method in the long run, you realistically want to buy players that are showing signs of good and positive uh, attributes, but they aren't producing score-wise at that time. So I guess the person that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about first off, like when do you think is the optimal time to sell a card? And like what do you look for in terms of like when you're selling a card on the market? So the toughest thing that I think comes out of kind of the way that you and I play so rare that we generally acquire cards to make our lineups better is when you have a guy, you, you know, you've acquired a card and the guy is just, you know, he takes off and now all of a sudden your card is theoretically worth twice as much as it was when you bought it, but you, you're using it and you're like winning stuff with it. So it's like, do I really want to sell this card that has been like so valuable to my lineups because selling it basically means my lineup is not going to be as strong as it has been. And for the most part, I, I end up keeping those cards. I really don't like, I mean, selling the, the fundamental buy low, sell high, like completely applies to so rare that 
you know, if you're good at evaluating players or think that, uh, you know, somebody might be underpriced because they went on a, a poor run of form. There was a uh, Valentin Castellanos from New York City FC was in, in an awful run uh, to begin the season. He was like one of the XG leaders, but he wasn't scoring and his price was tanking because everyone was like, oh, this guy's not any good. And then, you know, people bought at the bottom and he took off, you know, the XG kind of corrected itself. And now he's worth twice as much. And it's like, well, do I sell now, even though I got one cheap? And, you know, you're now selling, uh, you know, U23 forward. You know, hopefully you're selling at the peak. But if it's not, then you're going to miss out on those scores. And so I find that there are cards that maybe that you win and you kind of can hold them until a guy takes off. And if he doesn't, you know, if he's, maybe you have a good enough collection where he's not going to make your teams and you can sell those. But I think like the fundamental hardest thing on so rare is like, do I sell this guy that is now I can sell from for a very good profit, but is now making my lineups weaker. And that's, that's, I think the biggest uh, kind of conundrum that you face as a so rare manager. Yeah. I, I think that the biggest issue for me is so like people I will sell are one duplicates. Uh, if I end up with yeah. like a duplicate of a player and it's not someone that I will play, I generally sell. So for example, I have two Pedro Gonzalez's. And I haven't sold the duplicate because I can use two each game week. And I think he's underpriced. Flip side, I won a second Ryan Gravenberg last week or two weeks ago. And I don't think that he's good enough to find his way into my lineups most of the time. So I was willing to sell his card, uh, the duplicate of it at that time. So duplicates are number one. Number two are people that I think are scoring hot that aren't necessarily going to consistently stay where they are. So, for example, we talked about previously you winning a Carlos Gill and playing a Carlos Gill. And, uh, Grant, he's injured right now. But um, that's a card where, like, yes, he was blowing up every single week. But I think he was going to be blowing up all the time. Like, I think that that would be a consistent outcome for him compared to that of some other cards where, like, I will get the card and I will look and be like, all right, this guy is on a hot streak of, like, five games. Will he maintain that hot streak? I don't know um, compared to that of someone else where I, I think that they could be a little bit more sustained. Um, and then third thing is what I don't understand, and I don't understand this at all within the SoRare Discord. And you want look at the – do you check the, the want to buy, want to sell, want to trade uh, messages at all? Uh, I look at actually the trade one more than the others, more okay. than the sell and buy. But, yes, I do go in there. So I used to read them. Nowadays, I just really don't don't because everything in there is pretty much junk to me. But like the thing I don't understand is like player sprains his ankles and out for a month. You see like seven people wanting to sell. You don't sell when a guy's injured. You don't sell when a guy's on his bottom because there's no point. So if you get someone like that, you just have to ride him out, wait till he comes back, then sell him. If you're selling guys at the, at the floor, it makes no sense. Similarly, like you see a guy have like five straight big weeks in a row and it's like, you see eight want to buy this players it makes no sense. Like, why are you buying a guy at this peak that wasn't worthwhile for you to buy previously at his floor? So like for me, like, I mean, just looking at my uniques here, cause they're in the front of my screen. So I bought, I, I traded for Idaguchi from Gamba. Oh, like two weeks after I, I got him, he had, he got COVID. Well, I can't sell him right after he gets COVID. Not to mention, like if I look at him and he's a good example this is a guy I brought in to utilize as a midfielder. So like you look, his statistics are terrible. Right here, statistics look awful. His L40, L15, L5 is, is terrible. Well, you click on his, his scores and you open it up to all, you see he used to crush it. Yeah. And you sort of see like, yes, he's been bad a good chunk of this year. Well, Gamba was really bad for a good chunk of this year. So it's realistic to think that, he could be a guy that really steps back up to this like 60, 70 type player where he's getting a lot of all around score, which is what I want. Like you see all these games are like with massive all around scores. So I'm not going to sell him when he's on this L15 or L40 of 40. And when he has COVID, it, it just doesn't make sense. Similarly on a buy purchase I made that I thought was really good. I bought Alvaro Madron and I bought him. So let's see, I bought him around five, three is when I bought him. So we're going to look and see when 5-3 was in terms of game weeks. And, and I'll explain my thought process when I bought this card. So if you look at 5-3, so May 3rd, right around 162, 163 is when I bought him. So if you look at it, I bought him right here. So as soon as I bought him, went absolutely nuts. 
So what did I see in terms of like buying him that made sense to me? I saw a guy that was playing minutes, starting every game, and it just wasn't quite clicking because he was in a new role. So yep. like, I was watching the games, and I saw that the player was still there that could produce this. I just was getting this, but that wasn't going to be his long-term consistency. So like again, I bought him here. Now a good time to sell him, but again, I think he – Watching them play and watching him play, I thought there was a good consist or a good chance. Like, do I think he's going to maintain a hundreds consistently? No, but did I think he was a seventy to eighty point producer on a relatively frequent basis? Yes, I thought that was a possibility. Granted, then he got COVID or didn't get COVID, but then he got COVID protocols and got sent out, yeah. and he struggled to get back in. So hopefully, he plays this weekend actually, and I can uh, start utilizing him again. But Something like those two guys are people that make sense from that perspective of like, why are you buying this guy? Like what makes sense about him? Another guy I bought that sort of fits the bill was you saw me. So I bought him around 6'10". And again, like you're going to look and he was playing every single game around this time frame. He just wasn't getting those goals. But what I noticed was this is a guy that took every set. This was a guy that had penalty kicks. And he was playing 90s every game at that time, or he was playing mostly 90s, a good frequency amount of the time. So I was really intrigued by him and thought he was a really good play consistently. And obviously, he's been okay for me. He hasn't been bad. But, like, those are some of the thought process I've had. What do you think about some of the stuff I just said with that? No, I think that that makes total sense. I I was actually going to follow up. Have you ever had a card where the guy got really good, like that Madron card? Like, he obviously took off. And theoretically, you could have sold at the peak. And, and the, the unique example, meaning like his unique card, probably isn't the right example. But if you had a rare or super rare. Um, I know you... that I sold the Nani super rare midfielder, which is a significantly worse card than his forward card, at um, a discount. Or not at a oh, discount. But... I sold him at the peak. The, the real question was, did you have you ever sold a card thinking that you would reacquire it when it when the guy was not, you know, on this hot streak. Yes. I, I, at least I, maybe I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's been cards where I have, um, sold with the intent of maybe buying back at another time frame. Uh, that makes sense to me in terms of buying them. I'm trying to think of, of who I bought recently. Um, let's see, looking through here. So I bought, some Malinkovich Savage, nothing recently. Have you bought any rare cards that you've done that with? So no, but I came very close with uh, Gianni Bruno, who I bought at the end of last season. And then on the transfer, he transferred and he transferred into a significantly better side, had some midweek games. And it was kind of like I bought him at his floor and I thought the transfer, and I think he scored the first two weeks. And it was like, maybe I should sell this card because my challenger team like was okay. It wasn't great. And it was kind of like, would I be better off just selling the card now? And if something happened to him, then I can just buy back later at a, at a cheaper price. I did not sell. And now he is at a much cheaper price. Like the, like the route that I was thinking was one that I was like, Oh, I'll just do this. Obviously when you sell the card, like I said before, like your lineups get worse because you're selling the guy who has been playing really well for you. But Ultimately, I've never like rebought a card of just because a guy, you know, like sold high and then rebought it. And usually like I sell a card and I just hope the guy never plays again. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it's not so much as like I will sell a card and plan to rebuy it, whereas more so like I I buy a card and I will sell it and then buy other cards. And then eventually in the future, if that card ends up being a more viable option, I will uh, buy the card back. So, like, for example, I still have him as Yuma Suzuki. I actually looked when he was being rumored to Anderlecht, I was looking at buying a second one because I figured if he went to Anderlecht, it would be a really profitable move for him uh, compared to where he is. But, yeah, so I guess it's more so, like, when I sell players right now, it is to fill in holes that I have or other ideas that I have that I want to fill in at that time. And then similarly, it's I then don't have to buy that player back. But if the player ends up being good again to where it's like, 
okay, his price point is not where it should be. I'm going to buy a different card. I might buy him back type of thing. Um, so I, I guess that sort of answers that question without fully answering it, I guess. Well, I just, I, I have this, this issue where like the, my goal now is to make my lineups better. And if I'm buying a guy who is struggling now, because I think he'll be better later, that technically doesn't help my lineups now. Like there's, I don't like try to speculate on that side much. Maybe I should do some more of that, mm -hmm. but that's kind of how I got to the point where I did. Like we talk about this, like Rusnok super rare that I bought a while ago. Like I bought him when he was playing horrifically, but I was like, no, no, this guy's good. It was my first super rare. So it was like more, I spent more on that card than I had. And I think any other card up until that point. And it was kind of like, I think at that point I was still in my like lineup building stage. Whereas now I feel like I have my lineups pretty well set and now I'm just trying to improve them. And so selling guys that are playing really well and buying guys who are not playing well runs counter to me trying to improve my teams. Yeah, no. And I agree with that too. It's, it's difficult to really sell someone when they're really churning because it's difficult. So uh, I guess we'll move into, I think something that people will enjoy because like we all make big mistakes and, and we also make really good purchases. So I'm going to pull up your gallery here first. And what is probably your number one best purchase? Then what is your number one most underrated good purchase? Uh, I think just from a usage perspective, it's that Rusnok super rare that I bought. Like yeah. the from a from a value standpoint, like I got uh, Jao Felix and Alfonso Davies cheap, and it's only because I was kind of early on the platform. I think I bought them in January, February. I mean, they're like my two most valuable cards according to that page. But Rusnok like just put me in another tier. Like I was, I basically moved uh lineup you know into tier um excuse me into division three and i've kind of had more success that way but like rusnak particularly had like took off after i got him and so that obviously helped like not only did that did the use of the super rare allow me to get more competitive but he also turned around so that was like by far um one of my better purchases yeah and, and then so you paid what 0.18 for it 0.185 i think yeah yeah so 0.185 and you just see what he's brought in in terms of results. Like you're talking like two ish ether from this one card already. Like now, so I, I always, when people are like, I generated like two ether with that card. So it's worth two ether. And that's not really how it should work. It should be like, I generated two ether. He was attributed for 20% of all of those cards. So it's now granted, like, as you see every single one of those games week, except for this one, he attributed for more than, that 20% that he should sure. pay for. So yeah, like, his two ether probably he generated, let's say a half an ether worth of that reward. So, I mean, again, that return is fantastic. Um, poor Bryce, man, uh, poor Bryce. Yeah, it's very it, it is too. It's like, I remember he asked me, he's like, what is the value of this card right now? Like what's a fair offer? And I told him, I'm like, probably like 0.175 to 0.2, somewhere in there. And then you guys did the deal. And then Rue Snack. And the issue is, is he has no – his midfielders are kind of – his midfield is okay, but, like, overall, there's some issues with his team that this card could really help. And that's why, like, I don't recommend ever selling anyone at the bottom. Uh, Rue Snack's one of those guys. Like, when we talked about Rue Snack plays all the minutes. You bought him probably in this area here. Yeah, I'm I, um, I bought him, let's see, June 7th, which uh, – June 7th is right around here, which is right around 170. So you bought him like right here ish. Right. Like literally yeah. the start of the green. Of the yeah. green but again, you were able to go through what we were just talking about with Madron. You look, he played 90, 90, 90, 90, 89. And this is a guy that if you look back. I was going to say, there you go. If you look at that chart. Yeah. He produced. So like he was only playing, he was getting 90 minutes every game. He just wasn't quite getting his decisives. This graph and this graph are not much different. It's just at this point, he was on a cold streak. So like, I hate selling cards that are on the floor. I just don't, just don't do it. I just, it's not something that I find to be um, worthwhile. I find it very, like you just ride a guy. Like if you bought a guy, there's a reason you bought a guy. Like, I'm not saying like you ride him to the floor and like, 
crash with him. But if there's nothing different than he's just not quite getting the decisives at that time, there's no reason to be shipping him out for nothing. Um, so what is your like under the radar goodbye that you made? So I'm going to, I'm going to put this into some sort of perspective because I think this is a combination of one of my better sales and one of my worst buys back to back. So when I started early on so rare, I was essentially avoiding buying goalies because they're so expensive. I mean, it's like, that's a problem that a lot of people who are new uh, have because it's you just not yourself a lot of money, not buying a U23 goalie, which you and I talked about a lot when I get yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think it's just, you know, you just have to suck it up and do it, which really, you know, it's, you don't feel great about it. So I basically, when I finally decided to dive in, I dove in on MLS and I bought a goalie. I bought three goalies that were just like old MLS guys who I knew would start. And so one of them was Brad Guzan, who I, you will not find on my page from anymore. But I bought Brad Guzan for close to nothing. Um, let's see, 0 0.098 I paid for this rare Brad Guzan. And during... So this was uh, February, early February. And then obviously people gear up for uh, the start of the MLS season. And I sold them for 0.58, which was great. You know, that's a nice profit. The only reason I sold that card is because I had an offer at 0.58 and there was another one on the market for 0.52. And I think mine was maybe had more XP or whatever it was. So I was like, if I have this offer, I could easily just buy back you know, I'm selling for 0.58. I can get another one for, for 0.52. I bought the first one at 0.098. So I'm like, this is great. But really buying Brad Guzan at 0.52 when I had two other MLS goalies was a, was a horrific decision, like horrific. And like the way that I was playing, I wasn't playing D3. Like all I had was either Champion America D4 and All-Star D4. And yes, having three goalies is better than two but it's not like I had great players. I just need guys who started. So I had Guzan, uh, Tim Melia, and Clement Jopp. Jopp has since left MLS, mm -hmm. and I sold Melia also. But like buying back in right away, even at less than what I just sold this card for, like I definitely should have just used that money to buy almost anything else, <laughs> including a Rusnok Super Rare at that point. But that, but because I used like a decent amount of ETH to buy this card back, even though I just got it, like that, like stalled my development because I was just like, oh, let me go quickly get another one of this card I wasn't really using, and it was like it just didn't make sense, and so I'm like ruining that to this day. No, I mean that's that's a that's a great story. I mean because it's true, like you made one, you made a great deal, like in in general, it's a great deal, but you could have made an even better deal by just not buying him back. So it makes right. a lot of sense. I know for a fact that my best buys, I mean, my best buy was for sure. I bought a bundle, which we've talked about before, and I can probably bring it up um, here, but it might take me a minute. It was buying a full bundle. Like I bought a couple bundles. So I bought a bundle from Steve Disk that was 85 Ether. So, so this these are actually galleries, though they're not like yeah. auction bundles. Yeah. Sorry, I, I've also bought bundles that made right. sense too. But this was a. Let me see if I can go super. It might speed up a little bit. I bought a gallery from Steve Disk, and it was a eighty-five ether gallery. And then, like right after that, we just sort of hit the moon on Sower, and everything just dropped because ether went up to like a gajillion dollars in ether. And it just wasn't worth what it was at one point. And then also, I can probably actually look at this. If I just sort it out a little bit better here, I might be able to find the other gallery. So I bought a gallery from Swabaraz, and I paid it was right before the boom. And this was my best buy for sure. So I bought, well, I got some Bongondos from Steve Disk. It was this part of this deal around here. And I made a couple deals like this. So I bought his gallery at the time for 2.2, or I, I paid nine ether for the gallery that was probably worth like 11 and a half. But by the end of the next week, it was worth like 48. 
And I, so I broke it down. So like, this is only going to show you the forwards, but you're going to see how efficient the gallery was that I bought and how usable most of the cards were that I bought. So for example, I had, I got a Murata, which is usable, uh, Toko Akami, which is still my number one super rare champion in Europe forward, which again, that's an issue, but we'll not go. <laughs> He's usable. Um, I got a Zardis, a Uremchuk, a David rookie. I think that's his rookie. A Voland, which I sold a long time ago. A Nani forward card. Leon Bailey, Rui Diaz, Victor Oshiman rookie card. Enter Valencia, Bonganda. That's just the forwards. So if I look through some of the others, I don't remember who else I bought in the gallery. Otherwise, I would just pull it up quickly. But so it was like a couple days before the boom. And that was. This can't, like, there isn't a better buy I've made, I guess, than this because it's it really gave me the start that I needed to play in a frequent amount of leagues uh, and, and the areas that I've done. Have you bought any bundles? I don't think you've bought any bundles or gallery-related things, have you? No, I haven't. I think one of the, the things to point out for that deal is that we see a lot of people in Discord, not a lot, we see people in Discord like, oh, I'll buy your gallery. And uh, Pavel Trader is obviously like the most popular one. And I think we talked on a Sober Andrews podcast about like what goes into buying galleries and why people don't pay, you know, that roster price value. Uh, but the that one that you bought was one of the more efficient galleries that mm -hmm. we've that I've seen. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to buy this gallery because I can buy it for 10 ETH and I can sell it for 15 but you've used so much of that gallery to win cards that are now in your gallery that I think people kind of underestimate the possibility of doing that as well. Like it's like they have like, oh, I'll buy all of these cards and I'm going to sell them all. But like you could buy a gallery and have extremely usable cards in there and kind of sell the rest off. And even if you don't necessarily make everything back, you could win the rest. And so like I don't think there are a ton of people who you know have the bankroll to buy all these galleries, but there's a benefit in buying in bulk. It's, you know, the Costco version of this. Yeah, there definitely is. Like if you have like, especially when you're starting out, if you can get like a giant chunk of cards, like I would say that gallery put me in like D three and four global challenger champion America. I don't think there was much Asia in there. So like, it basically put me in four regions, like yeah. fully put me in those regions where I had legit players. Like, did I have, Lewandowski or Neymar or something? No, but like, especially at that time, like you get Oshaman, you get Jonathan David, those are decent end cards. You get, like, I think I got like Sergei Milinkovic Savage, like usable card. Uh, yeah. I got Jossie's artist we just saw, one of the better forwards in MLS. So like, it was a massive coup. It was a massive like haul for me to bring it in. So like, it was, it was a great situation for me. But here's one that's under the radar, I would say. So I pay, going into D1 America, I knew what my plan was and I was implementing my plan and I wanted it started for week one of the MLS season. So I bought Christian Espinoza. Well, actually I bought Yamil Assad, who's a dumpster fire. And the reason I bought Assad was he looked good and, and he like, I would have bought it again. Like if you replicate the situation based on what I had information wise, I would probably buy it again. But the one I really wanted was Espinoza, but I didn't know if I could get him because he was like three days later in the auction house. And I knew I could get both. I knew if getting both was a situation that was fine. So I just had to buy Assad, who might be one of my worst buys. And he's a disaster. Like, I don't even, I will see. I don't even know if he's won me a reward and I paid three ether for him. Nope. Nope, he did. He got me a fifth. Got me, got me a fifth. So like, again, disaster, awful card. That's just not really been worth much. But I also bought the Espinosa card. Now, let me preface this by saying that if we open up Christian Espinoza and I'm going to go to his um, scores, he's not great. I think we would both agree he's pretty average at best, but he plays every single game, which we talked about before, and he does have the ability to get decisives. Like you see, like every third game or so, he gets a decisive. And like sometimes he's on set pieces. What's up? He was on set pieces for a little bit. 
he still is. He still takes some yeah. of them before his injury here. But so we're going to, so again, like this is a guy who we're talking like mediocrity at best. Like he's not great. Well, if you look at the rewards I've won with him, it's absurd. I've cleared off 7.1 ether in rewards with him. I've gotten five podiums with him. And we're talking like San Jose's played like 25 games. So it means every fifth game they play, I'm on the podium using this card. Then another every fifth game, I'm getting a reward with this card. And it was better before he got injured recently. Like when they were at 20 games, I was pretty much at this return. Yeah. That's really good. And for someone that isn't great, like now granted, I did not do well in the reward pools. Uh, I generally got very poor end rewards, but like I got no Choa. Yeah. So like I was able to sell that. I think I sold it for like one and a half ish. Uh, I sold Bello. I sold Acosta. I sold Pedro Santos and then bought him. I, that This wasn't intended, but I sold Santos for, at the time I think it came out, I sold it for like 0.8. And then I bought a Santos for like 0.2 a month later than that because he just hadn't been doing much. And then he's been really good since. So like I probably sold half of these cards and have been able to, like I sold Hani Mukhtar. I probably sold a good chunk of these cards. But so again, like this is a card that just under the radar has really churned for me really well that you wouldn't um, assume. Similarly, like we talked about Carlos Gill before the season started, I thought Gill was the best player in the MLS. Um, I thought he was the best, despite obviously Vela and all those other options. And no one respected him before this season because of like he's typically injured. But he hits an age range that I really like. Uh, he hits the ability. He hit the too good for MLS scale level. So I bought Gill before the season started. And we're going to look at this. And you're going to see this card just racked up rewards for me. And I think I paid like 0.9 for him at the time. Um, and at his peak, he was probably selling for like three-ish. So like this is a card that probably like three and a half X value while I was winning all of these rewards as well. So I think that like stuff like this is, is very under the radar. And like, I have a lot of rares that have been very productive for me as well. Um, I, I know we've talked about um, Yuya Oki and Koki Machida, how like they're like the alpha U23 duo. Um, they're like the Asian version of Malaysia and Bees Low, except for probably a bit better. Um, so they've been they've been guys that have really churned for me. Granted, like I've had the rare uh, the rare cards of them, and they were really churning for me in like D three and D four. So like the rewards may not be as good because D three and D four, but like I th this is D three and D four only, and I have like five top ten finishes. That's pretty good for rare cards getting that many top end finishes. So, um, so who are some of your worst buys now? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to piggyback on this uh, hidden hidden gem one, though, for a okay. quick second. Okay. Um, so I bought one of the first – so I think that Rusnak Supero was the first one I bought. I believe the second one was this guy. He's a center back from Minnesota United, Bakai wow. Debasi. And I bought his super rare, and this was another one where, like, I was hesitant – not I was hesitant to buy, but it was like I liked him as a player, but um, – but I thought he would be more helpful just as a card. And it was like, I was, I didn't want to spend like a ton on, on super rares, but it was like, in order to, to be really competitive in D3, I felt like I needed a second super rare. So I got this card and like the number of rewards with him is, hasn't been that great, but like every single one of these cards has been extremely valuable. Like obviously Vela, I haven't even, I've barely been able to use cause he's been hurt, but like that Shabilko card, I think was in the one that I won global all-star uh, D4 with. And then I think I sold Savarino and Guillerme for half an ETH together. And it's like, this guy's not that he's like a nobody, but he's just like a guy who like churns out scores and to have that as a super rare D3, like I didn't pay that much for it. And it, it was just one that's been like incredibly valuable, like to my gallery in terms of, my SO5 lineups. Like I paid 0.182 for him and 0.185 for Rusnak. And, you know, those guys have contributed to me winning, uh, you know, Carlos Vela or uh, Carlos Vela and Carlos Hill. Like that's kind of what you want when you buy cars like this. Like you want to be able to use them in lineups to make you, to allow you to win like better cards. 
Exactly. And, and that's that's the whole crucial key to all of this is that you are trying to win good cards so that you can use good cards and win better cards, then use those better cards to win even better cards. So right. a whole moving up progress here. So now let's talk about your worst purchases on the platform. Um, I know where you're going to go for one, so we'll just move right on down to them. Who? Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, what a, what a good person to buy it from, though. I'm, I personally think this was one of your best deals on the platform. So right, also yeah. here, let's talk about this real quick. You paid about as much for him as you did for Rusnak Super Rare. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And know you. And I think, let me see. I was trying to pull. Have I won anything with that guy? Mm, let's see. Let me see. You have won well, a lot of rewards with him, actually. You won well, two cards and you won two thresholds. So that Joan Umari card is the first reward I've ever won on So Rare. Was it really? Um, I don't own him anymore. In fact, that other one, Hussein Balich, I don't own either. Uh, but if you, let's see. Anymore. So I got 154. When did I get this card? Because mm -hmm. I'd like you to pull up the... You bought it like April 1st. So let's see. Yeah, April one. So April one is. This is gonna be so ugly. It's I know it's bad because we've talked about it before. So you bought him April one, which was like one fifty three. So you bought him right here. I think you played him that. Yeah, you played him before this. You bought him in between this game and this game. Mm -hmm. So he got. So he. Um, yeah, I think the first game he had an arrow that led to a goal, and then he got a red card. So obviously he was suspended for the next game. That green dot right up there was before they changed the game weeks. So that was actually excluded from a game week, if I remember correctly. So I actually never even got that score. And then he got a red card in a cup match. And then, as you can see, played once again when he got another red card. And then he stopped playing and now he's out on loan. Yeah, but he's been good on loan. He's been great on loan. Yes. So yeah, no, like I knew he was going to talk about this card. Uh, he bought this for me, and at the time, like as you saw, he was killing it. He was doing really well. Um, so, but I just didn't need him at that time. So the reason I bought him though is because I had two other guys from, like I had a two of his teammates. So I was like, yeah. oh, I should get he. He's a center back. You can see his scores were very consistent. He had some high scores as well, and it was like it just made total sense. And the guy just turned into an absolute dumpster fire as soon as I bought him. Yep, exactly. So, all right, why don't you give me your worst buy that I'm not thinking of right now? So, I, I don't even know. Well, no, I know this is definitely the worst buy, and it's actually somebody who's very close to your heart. So, I bought uh, a Chris Durkin, like, at the peak of the boom, and I I don't know. I still, like, I have two of them there, and you can see the two prices. Like, I paid um, – oh, actually, I guess they don't show no, – they they're showing do. different one. Point two. I, oh, I opened another one. Point two one six. So point two one six uh, was on. What was the date of that one? Uh, it was on three one. So so this is just to accentuate how bad of a purchase that was. I have I had a Durkin already, a Durkin rare, that I bought for point oh five, two weeks earlier, and now I'm like, oh, there's a boom going on. So then I decide to like bid on this auction, which is already four times more than the one that I already bought. And I'm like, oh, I'll just like push the price. This is like when you, if you're in like, you know, some sort of auction leagues in fantasy football and you're just like, oh, I'll bid, like push the price up and I won it. And I'm like, oh, I'll be able to flip this card because everybody's a boom. He's a, you know, at the time he was headed for the US national team. And um, as you can see, I still own this card and I probably have won nothing from it. Let's see. No, no, again, wrong. You, you've won a card. You've won a card and a threshold with him. It's, uh, what card did I buy? Oh, yeah, I sold that card, too. <laughs> At least but, like, it was just, it, there was no reason for me to bid on that card. That was back, like, when I really, like, wasn't focused on what I was doing. It was just like, oh, I'm going to speculate that I, I'll be able to sell this card for more. And, like, 0.216 at the time. I mean, that's an absurd, if you probably looked at his price graph, it's probably the most that anybody's ever spent on a Chris Durkin rare card. And yet, and it was my second one. Like that was what made it so much worse is that there was no reason for me to buy it because I already had one. And yet 
there I was buying it. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't great. So for me, I know we talked about it the other day. So at this time, I'm going to give this background story on this card. Oh, actually, another great buy I had. So I talked to the person. And actually, the funny thing is, is this person is the person that I talked to. I bought the Eduardo Rare from and probably way overpaid for Eduardo Rare. But this guy really talked me into buying it. No, actually, I didn't buy the Eduardo Rare from him because uh, he wasn't buying one. He's like, you should go get an Eduardo card. So I went and bought the Eduardo Super Rare basically at his like recommendation and like so he doesn't have as good of rewards as something that's nice though yeah and again he doesn't have as good of rewards because you see i use him in all-star a lot so like now grant he has two gas d2 podiums which is great but like i've used him a lot there where like i did not get to use these big scores here most of them were not in winning lineups for me which was unfortunate but yeah. Um, I bought at this time again, like, I don't think either of us could have a buy that wasn't like the worst buy at the time that wasn't during the boom. Um, there's no way you don't have a buy that wasn't terrible during the boom. If you were still buying cards during the boom, this is unfortunate with AO Tanaka, by the way, he was part yeah. of the bundle I bought, but that I'm not even going to take blame for. Cause that I was, was going to say, there's nothing you do about that. Yeah. That was just a disaster. Um, but my worst purchase, we're going to have to find him. I actually had two of him but I sold one of him. But the funny thing is, is I, he was actually very valuable to me winning rewards. And I know the person I sold him to also has had a lot of value with him winning rewards. So it's Kim Tae Hwan. So the, the background story on this Kim Tae Hwan card is that at the time the boom was going on and you couldn't buy cards. Like you had to pay your like firstborn child to buy a card. And U23 especially you could not buy any card worth anything. So I'm looking at the auction houses and the um, the secondary market at the time, and I couldn't buy a card. So I'm looking, and I think I had like a full U23 team for D2 without a U23 defender. I couldn't just didn't have one, couldn't find one. And I was looking and like every defender was like three ETH. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't do this. I, I can't buy one. And so there was a Kim Tae Hwan that was on the market at 1.5. And let me preface this by saying that a Kim Tae Hwan at 1.5 was the best on the market. Like it really was. But I would, have rec I would reckon that anybody on the platform that has outright bought cards on the secondary market at price, those are almost everyone's worst <laughs> every time so anyways look what was the uh, what was the date for your kim taehwan uh well so i had two and i'm not sure i think this was yeah this was the one i paid so this is the this is the correct one so i bought it on 227 so i, I have a kim taehwan rare card that i bought on three six yeah, so I'm sure yours looks terrible. As just, well. just as bad. Yeah. <laughs> so when we look at Kim Tae Hwan, we're we Laird and I did this yesterday when we figured out this would be our discussion points today, and we're going to show you his super rares, and you're going to see how his super rares look uh, based on where I bought it. But tell you which one was me. <laughs> this one. Uh, and looking at that is not great. Now that said, I think I sold this. I think I the second one I actually bought here. And I think I sold the second one here ish, maybe, I don't know. But so like the second one, I sort of made up for a little bit, but again, like there was nothing on the market. And when I looked at Kim Tae Hwan, I saw a guy, he scores decently, but he's a fullback. Um, and he just isn't the best, but like, I probably bought him around, let's see, uh, give or take in this area where he was scoring really well and he's out. And I don't even know exactly what is wrong with him currently, but we're going to look back here and I will actually probably have won some rewards with him. I would assume. Yeah. So like I've won a couple rewards with him, including winning division two. So like, even though this card was terrible, I still have returned one and a half ether on this card or no. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much like one and a half ether on this card. And I have a second place in Asia D two. And I got a first place in U 23 D two with this card. So even though it's my worst card, I still have had some return. But man, that card was, and I knew it at the, like three days later, I was just like, oh, that was terrible. 
And, and it so, was. And I was just like, uh. Like, I think I bought the second one similarly to how you bought the Chris Durkin. The only difference is that, like, when I paid 0.689 for it compared to 1.5, that hurt. So yeah. <laughs> I was right, like, I, was, like, I, I think I remember sitting there being like, yeah, I think he's going to go to like one. So I'm going to at least pump him to one. And then I got him at 689. I was like, oof, that was ugly. Right. So, because it's your own, like, you have the comparable card that you would want to sell. And yet you're now set, setting the market floor correct. below where you would want it. Yeah. Like, if you go back to his, to the price graph for the rare ones, the, what got me, so I had, I was in a similar situation of just like, there, like you said, there weren't that many on the market, but if you go, like I bought mine March 6th. So, so you just go to March 1st, like, and see from there. The worst part is just how liquid the card has been since I bought it. This year? From oh, no, no, thankfully not. No, I'm like 0.18 somewhere around there. Um, right here. Right. And so it's like, the number of dots that are under that line yeah. is just so tilting, particularly because they keep going down. <laughs> but like, I, I'm one of these people, like I, there's no reason for me to sell this card now because I'm taking such a, a tremendous loss. Correct. He's still U23 eligible. I, I don't think I ever use him though, but like, it's, it, it's one of those that like, if you like, you should be okay, like accepting a loss on a card so you can use the ETH somewhere else. But that one is just like so dead that I'm just like, I'm I'm taking this one to my so rare grave, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's difficult when you look at stuff like that because like you just, you have the opportunity to get a card in value like that. Sometimes it's just like, uh, and it's cringy. And similarly, like I remember um, there's cards that we don't sell that we get offers for that we regret. Like I got offered a ether i think for leonardo pretty sure i got offered an ether for leonardo super rare and i can't sell it anymore for like i probably couldn't sell it for like 0.4 um and i i got offered an ether for it i'm pretty sure at some point um in the last couple months so like again like you look at stuff like that like we'll talk we talked about joao felix like Joao Felix, you're not regretting buying Joao. Even even today, like buying what you probably paid for Joao Felix is not bad, and it's not the end of the world. But no. like, you definitely regret not selling him at certain points. I'm sure. So like, if you go back to February first, you considered selling him all of this. You were in consideration to sell him all of this time. And never did, obviously. And then obviously now we're back down here and it's terrible. I wonder where I bought him at. So I paid, I bought him before the boom. Yeah, I paid 0. 0.302. I paid one-ish. I probably am one of these purchases in here. So like even today, like I could probably sell him for 0. 0.6. It's not even that bad. Um, it's just like I could have got nine ether form. I much would have rather had nine ether form, but that was part of the learning process, I think, for me. I think for you, too. Like, you had been on since November, uh, but you had never really seen anything like that while being on the platform. And that was something that I had never seen. Like, we, and also, like, here's the thing, too, with booms, and not even just booms, but, like, in general, like, booms and spikes and any of that stuff. Stuff could change from there, and it could, like, never come back down. Right. Right. And if it never comes back down and you sold Joao Felix at nine and then all of a sudden he's at 30 and never comes below 30 again, you feel like an absolute moron. So <laughs> right. it's a situation where you really have to make a decision on that perspective and decide like what you want to do. Because like sometimes like, you can have a card and just sort of sit on him and it's not a big deal. And like Joao Felix, is, was that for you? Like, were you using him? no. Is he super valuable at the time for you? No, but like at the time, you also probably viewed that as like, hey, this is my chance to like hit something big. Yep. And bigger than nine. And at, at the time, like nine ether was probably um, let's see if there's a USD amount to it. There's no USD amount to it. But like at the time, like nine ether was probably like nine or ten K. Something like that. Yeah. Maybe that might have been a little higher. 10 to 15, that. Maybe 10 to 15. Yeah. So like, but you're thinking like hey, this could be a 30 Ether card and Ether could be $2,500 at some point. And all of a right. sudden, like, you just sold for 15000 a guy that you sold for, that could have went for seventy five. So, right. um, 
it's situations like that where you need to decide. But like another thing too is with buying and selling, like you need to figure out what the best times to buy and sell are. You don't want to sell a guy on his peak or you want to sell a guy on his peak. You can never sell the guys on their floor. Like not to say you can't sell guys on their floor if they're older. If you have a guy that's like 31 and he's just sort of like not being great, you can sell him. But like I have Ferran Torres. I'm not going to sell Ferran Torres when he's totally in the dumps because he's a young player that plays for Manchester City that like if he gets in the squad and plays every game, this is a guy that's going to absolutely eat. Yeah. So it's just very difficult and people really struggle to grasp like you can't sell a guy who's young for nothing. Like that's just something you can't do. If you do that, you're just going to have a massive failure under on your hands long term. And, and it's something that, that people struggle with because people want to sell guys that are not doing well at that time. But you really need to sell guys that are doing well and getting guys that are doing poorly that can perform well in the future. Those are the type of guys you want. So like we've talked about before, we talked about buying and who to buy, who to sell thing. When you're trying to buy players, you want to look for guys that play 90 minutes every game that can score relatively well, that maybe are on a five or 10 game skid or a guy that's coming back off of injury. Um, I forget who I was thinking about recently. That was someone I wanted to, oh, so Tanane. I, I haven't bought him because it just didn't really make sense for me. But like, Usama Tanane is a top five forward on the platform, not like in challenger or just on the platform, but he came into the lead year super fat. If you haven't seen pictures, check him out. He's definitely came in overweight, a little and, overweight. And his cards were going for absolutely nothing. Like if we look at his rare price graph. Like you see, he used to be like a 0.4 card and he's been selling for under 0.2. Well, recently, He's gotten back into decent to better shape. And if you think that he's going to start playing again, which all indications are that he's probably going to, this is a guy that could go back up to averaging 65, 70 points per game. That's a really valuable player that you can get. So I, I think a player like that is something that people need to consider. Like those are the type of guys you want. Now, on the flip side of that, you don't go sell Tanane right now at point two E. That doesn't make sense because this is a guy that has massive upside that could hit upside that you've seen before. And there's really no reason he can't other than he just hasn't really been in the lineup recently. So um, I think that's a good thing to think about too. Do you agree? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm like uh, bothered that you're telling people not to sell him there. Cause that's when I want to buy him. I tried to buy him. I tried to buy him when he was even a little bit cheaper. Um, the issue for me is it's just not really I, we've talked about before like for me currently rares just I, I don't care enough about them at the moment sure. um, like for example like i'm gonna play him i'm gonna get him and then like am i gonna play him over noah lang am i gonna play him over bongonda am i gonna play him over ito or anawatu i don't know maybe maybe sometimes um but like it's not a pressing need whereas like his super rare if i get a super rare around like one ether all right that might be something that could be incredibly valuable to me going forward yeah no that makes sense for sure so, and, and I mean, I think you also are into, the, you're not as into that, that range as as, as I am, but like you're, you're probably looking for cheap ish super rares that can be really productive right now. That's kind of like what you're looking for, right? Yeah. I'm pretty much out of trying to accumulate more rare cards. So yeah. it's funny enough. I'm trying to accumulate either super rares or limiteds. The only rares I'm going to look to see, um, I'm going to look through my gallery and see, so like I right now, the only rares I buy are either a goalie that sort of makes sense or a like prolific type of player that's like really valu valuable to me. So like if I look through, like you're, you're going to see I want a lot of rewards. Um, this was just a trade that came in that, that what really wasn't anything like that. So I bought Insigne. Um, yeah, you're interested. I bought right? Insigne which of course as soon as I, I hate him he literally just killed my brains in for like the entire year and then since then he's just been terrible um i bought dean weberts which i think we talked about on one of the shows i bought him for a special weekly which i ended up getting a podium on which paid for so like that doesn't really count um i bought frank kessie i bought chalongaloo i bought mike mignon I 
bought Carlos Cuesta, which goes with a stack for me in D3 yep. or D2. I bought Memphis Depay. And I will go through one more page and then we'll go to yours. I bought Noah Lang. I bought Lautaro Martinez. I bought Talk of Mine, but that was for a weekly special, I believe. Um, and it was like one where I had a really good chance. I bought Sunamoto for a stack reasons. And then um, I bought Tony Cruz and Danovich for stack reasons. Jung Sung Rong for stack reasons. Zayla, because he was cheap and I think he's good. Um, Me too. So like in the last two months, every player that I've effectively brought in were guys that I brought in for a specific reason or are prolific players. So let's look at you, see sort of like what you've done as well. And, and like that, that's what like rares right now really needs to be the special rare, I guess, for me to bring in. So like for you, like what rares have you been bringing in? I was going to say, I, I really can't even remember the last rare that I bought. Um, I guess I could have done this on my gallery too. It would have saved time. So let's see. Yutaka Yoshida. No, I, that was a trade. I get, yeah, that was a Okay, be oh, slow. Beige Low, that's exactly who it was. Yeah. Yep. So Beige Low, you brought in Beige Low, similar, like stack reasons. Yeah. Tyler Miller, stack reasons. Yep. Um Tolkien, I assume you 20. I bought yeah, I bought that. That was but when was that? I mean, that's gotta be like well, it looks like you bought a few U23 MLS players two months ago. Two months ago, yeah. And a Dawn, stack reasons, and just having a good goalie. Um, so I, I think that a lot of things that people need to understand is, like, everybody's in a different stage with their gallery. Um, for, for Laird right now, he's looking for uh, – a few months ago, he was looking for decent to good rares. Like, he bought, like, Samansky, Emmanuel yep. Reynoso, Mensa. Oh, you won that as a reward. Um, Rui Diaz, was that a reward or did you buy that? Nope, I bought that. So he's, a couple months ago, he was buying rares that were really beneficial to him. Now he's looking for like cheaper, super rares that can really produce okay. My current stage is I'm looking for elite level super rares that can take me to the next level yep. um, or uniques that really help me out. And that's really what I'm looking for. So, um, all right. I think that's going to wrap it up for us today. Is there anything else you want to add here before we wrap up? No, I there's a... Uh... These, uh, that this whole series has been great. Uh, obviously, the three that I've been on have been excellent. But yeah, no, every all the guests that you've had have been really great, and I think uh, hopefully uh, you can keep these going at some point. Uh, you mean all the guests except for the first guest, right? Right. Yeah. No, I didn't even watch that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. So yeah, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you to all of my guests. I think I've had five or six. So thank you to all of you guys for for joining. I, I've had fun with this series. I think it's been really informative. I hope that you guys out there have enjoyed it and found it helpful for your own sober journey as well. Because like we just talked about, like everybody's on a different path uh, and everyone at every time is doing different things with their gallery, whether it be focusing on MLS instead of Europe or focusing on U23 instead of older players or D2 to D3 progression, D or D3 to D2, D4 to D2, three, D5 D4. So like everyone's on different journeys, but I think a lot of things we've talked about you can carry over from each one. So for the last time as of now, we're going to call it for today. Uh, good luck to everyone this weekend and going forward. For Andrew, I am Sean. We will see you guys later.